Hello and welcome along to this week's RTE Rugby Podcast. Bit of housekeeping to start off with this week. We're obviously coming up to Christmas, but we will bring you a podcast next week. It might not be out, might not be out on Wednesday like it normally is. Could be a little bit later in the week, but it will be in between those Christmas derbies and the round of URC games on New Year's Day. So keep an eye out for that. A slightly different show today. Just Bernard Jackman with me at the moment to run through the big talking points of the week. The biggest one being a a six foot nine second row and we'll get to that momentarily but in part two of today's podcast stay tuned because we have an interview with Caelan Doris I spoke to the Ireland and Leinster number eight yesterday about his new contract with the IRFU it's a good 20 minute chat with him about his his plans for the future working with Jack Neenaber over the last few weeks and uh, how he's dealt with the ups and downs of a busy year in Irish rugby unfortunately in that there is no Orgy Snyman conversation in that I recorded it yesterday morning, um, a few hours before that news became official, but it is still well worth a listen and it'll be up in part two of this podcast. Birch, I mentioned RG Snyman just there. No better place to start. Confirmed by Leinster yesterday, he'll join from Munster on what we understand is just going to be a one year contract. Interesting, Interestingly as well, there are going to be some stipulations or clauses around how much they can play him. Um. I might bring you back the whole way to, to last Thursday evening, though, when uh, Jerry Thornley's scoop in the Irish Times first landed on Twitter. Can you remember what your reaction was when you saw that pop up on your phone? I was surprised, but actually happy, to be honest. Happy yeah. staying at Irish Rugby. Um, happy that one of the provinces have been able to secure him. I'm I'm in favour of it, and that's not with my Leinster ex-player hat on. I, I genuinely think... He is one of the best players in the world. Um, and I know Munster have been so, so unlucky in terms of the amount he's been played for him. But I think back to that final in, uh, in Cape Town, I think he had moments in that game which helped Munster lift that trophy. Um, he'll have moments when he comes back from this injury where he's going to make Munster hard as a beast. And now I, you can start to look forward to potentially him being part of a Leinster team where they need someone of his quality that he's part of their their squad. Restrictions around how often he plays, um, because they have the bodies to um to get the job done, you know, most of the year. But I, I think obviously having looked at the last two finals against La Rochelle, um, the final they lost against Saracens, um uh, the semi final loss against La Rochelle, you just feel, you know, there there may be one one or I'd admit possibly two world class players away from um being able to to get over the line and I, I fully support the IRFU allowing the provinces you know go out and sign players of his quality obviously there's risks with his injury profile but I think he's so good and he's so different when he's fit that it's it's a risk worth having when you have lots of money like Leinster do and you have lots of other players um who can who can cover so like that's like if Jason Jenkins hasn't turned out to be the player that Leinster hoped he would be, let's be honest. Um, now, Joe, Joe McCarthy's obviously is kind of given Leinster that, or, or Leinster certainly think he will give them that. So, um, But Snyman, no one, there's no one in the pathway the same as Snyman. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a, I was surprised, but because it came from left field, um, but I think it's a good move. Yeah, it is. As you said, there's there's a balancing act. Just from Leinster's point of view, we'll talk about the Munster implications in a minute mm. or so. But but from Leinster's side of things, the way they're looking at it, as you say, there's there's a big risk and there's a big reward as well. Yeah. And ultimately, if you look at the fact that it's a it's just going to be a one year contract, there's you know a reported figure of about half a million euro being being put out there as well. It's a huge amount to to take a gamble on. But I suppose then from from the other point of view, you could kind of say, okay, well, well, Leinster could spend a lot less money on a player who's who doesn't have that injury profile and you, who you can almost guarantee is going to be available for 20 plus matches in a season. But ultimately, is that player going to get you over the line when you need it yeah. in a Champions Cup final? And that's the that's the thing Leinster need to balance and that's the risk they need to take, isn't it? Yeah, and I think it's, I, I think it's good to see them taking the risk, to be honest. I think they have played it safe maybe too safe in the last four or five years in terms of their non-Irish qualified players signings. Um, and I think, I think this is a bold, a bold move, but it's also, 
it's a reaction to not getting over the line. I mean, how frustrating must it be for for the Leinster squad to to be probably the most consistent team in Europe, play some of the best rugby, you know, from whatever September to April, and then not have anything significant to show for it. And and you do feel, I certainly feel, Snyman can help them get over the line. And now look at they may end up getting over the line this year w- without him, but mm. I certainly think it it adds to their their. Just to be just on the record, like I was in favor of Munster re signing Slyman um after his injury problems. I, I felt I felt that it was only right that they, they basically doubled down and, and they did. Um and also I, I'm not really I'm not I don't think it's fair really that they have to choose between John Klein and uh, and um and RG Slyman. So I have sympathy for Munster from mm-hmm. that point of view. Um I think it was an unfortunate set of circumstances that led to, to Munster having two non Irish qualified blocks. Um obviously John Klein not getting picked for Ireland for um a period of time and then going to South Africa. That wasn't really Munster's fault. Um and yeah, I, in some ways I I, I my I would I have I have sympathy for Munster. I, I think potentially if he's been allowed to stay in Ireland, he potentially would be allowed to stay in Munster. But once that decision was made, um and he's he's gonna leave Munster, well then I have no issue with him going going to Leinster or Connacht or Ulster if that had been the case. Yeah, and the the added wrinkle in on top of that to to just kind of add to the the frustrations of Munster is as you were saying, you know they they were put in that unenviable unenviable position of having to to choose between the two, um, a problem not from their own making, and it's just funny when you think about it that it's ultimately Leinster's future coach who who gives yeah. John Klein that cap in the first place as well. I mean, there's just. There's frustration no. around every corner. No, there is. It's brutal. It's brutal. It's brutal <laughs> for Munster. Uh, look, I, I uh, potentially, like, potentially Munster might not have been able to afford the uh, Slyman anyway. You know, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. Whereas obviously Leinster can afford him. Um, but it's just yeah, the the way it all worked out is, and now Nina Bar obviously being at Leinster. Um, yeah, it's ironic, isn't it? Yeah, it's a funny one, and I'll. I'll move it on now to to Kaelin Doris because like I I think it's probably it has sparked a bit of discussion around the the way central contracts have gone and I know it's probably oversimplistic to draw lines between Kaelin Doris getting bumped up to a central contract with the IRFU and Leinster having the money to bring in a player like Gorgi Snyman but when you see those two things happening within the space of 24 hours it's hard not if you're a fan of one of the other three provinces, it's hard not to draw lines between those two. No, absolutely. It's um uh but I don't think I think Caelan Doris deserves to be on central contract contract. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Um and I suppose Leinster's argument would be that they they the, the model is very simple. So uh, um it's not very simple, but the model is 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 kind of black and white in that um if you can create enough centrally contracted players you benefit from that um by by obviously easing now the other side of that is obviously they lose the most players for world cups and six nations and they can have an effect on the squad but if i don't get a coach out there who wouldn't prefer to have a bag full of internationals um and have the hassle of having to manage that um but i think for munster now at least when i look at the munster team and you see the likes of a her and a dog bowl uh, Hodness, uh, Jack Crowley, etc. Um, they have to hope that they can become centrally contracted players in the next couple of years, and and that that I suppose power shift starts to sl- uh, move slightly. But at the moment, it's very lopsided towards Leinster. Now, Leinster would claim that they develop those players, but there is obviously a there's a there's a it's not it's not a fair playing field really because mm-hmm. of the population bias, the public or the private schools. Etc. So yeah, I I can understand why that needs that that would be looked at by fans at the moment. But I I do think, as long as the best players are getting the central contracts, um, I think that that has to be a carrot to the other provinces to try to continue to try and find players of that quality so that they can benefit from it in the long run. Let's um, let's go back to the actual rugby itself then, um, because there's plenty to get through from the Champions Cup and looking ahead to to Interpros over the next uh, over the next week or so. We'll start on Munster because uh, God help us, they gave us a lot to talk about on Sunday uh, away to Exeter. 
Nine points up at half time, 11 points up with just under 20 minutes to play. Bonus points secured at that stage. And in the end, they only left with that uh, with that four try bonus point. How did that happen? Look, it was it was very weird. I think they were unlucky with the Jack Dunn try, and you could say they were unlucky with the second with the with the last try, the, the Slade try. Um, potentially should have been called back for offside, not Slade. I think the the, the, the lazy retreating runners, players. the lazy runners were, yeah. were a tricky one, but he never seemed to. I never really seemed to enter the uh the conversation with the with the TMO, and I know Ty Byrne was trying to um get that point across, but by that stage it was too late. Um. Yeah, it's a weird collapse. I mean, second half against Bayonne was was pretty, pretty poor as well. Now, in fairness, they did finish in their in their twenty two or outside of twenty two, um. But yeah, it just looked, just stopped playing. Like the, some of the rugby they were playing in the first half was, was exceptional. You know, really smart how to get around that blitz, the Omar blitz, the extra use, um, and obviously getting the four point four try bonus. You just thought Munster can cruise here and. Now, fairness, Exeter brought on, you know, had a good impact off the bench and, and they upped it. But, um, yeah, it was, and like the two tries, they're not defensive errors, really, you know, like mm-hmm. the, the last two tries. Um, you can question the back bounce. So, um, yeah, uh, I think for entry, the problem for entry is he got a reaction, you know, so there was a reaction there from Bayon, um, and they came out of the blocks pretty, pretty sharp. Uh, intensity was good. And yet they only finished with another point, and out of what three points out of out of the first two games. And when you look at that Bayon match, like obviously Bayon went and lost to Glasgow at home, and um, that form isn't isn't good, you know. So it's a, it's a, it's definitely I'd say it's a three point drop in that game rather than a two point. That should be a five pointer for them. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a poor start given they went into it. I thought they went into the Champions Cup in a good place, you know, good performance yeah. away to Leinster. Big performance against Glasgow, and now, now they're they will qualify, but they're looking at a, obviously a, a a low seeding. Yeah, and it's like, is it oversimplistic in that last twenty minutes to to talk about the power and how Exeter just stepped it up to a different level in those last twenty minutes, where Munster spent just under an hour, we'll say, picking the lock and picking it really, really well, and getting a lot of getting a lot of ground off it, but then. Exeter in the last quarter of the game just blew the door off the hinges and said, "Yeah, yeah, like and that's a young Exeter team, really. You know, it's a rebuild, um, by Rob Baxter. I think they're ahead of where they probably thought they would be. And that's a, that's a worrying thing for from um from a monster point of view that they just couldn't, they just couldn't handle that that Exeter power when it when it came, and it's kind of a feature a little bit of the Irish teams. I know." Or also had a good performance, but um, yeah, it's a little bit worrying. Is it's a little bit worrying in terms of our ability to to put together like really strong eighties. Um, since since the World Cup, but it, it's been it's been some really good patches, but it's also been it's been quite mixed as well at times. Uh, we'll talk about the positives as well because you kind of alluded to to it at the start, where the attack for you know three quarters of the game more or less was really really good and so much different to to last week like I remember this day last week we were talking on the podcast about how against Bayon when the main when the main attacking strategy didn't work they didn't have a plan B mm. they 100% had that on Sunday and they had a plan C at times as well mm. where if they weren't if their quick passing wasn't working you could see Jack Crowley and Antoine Frisch were just dropping a couple of little attacking kicks over towards the yeah. touchline. You know, uh, that's how Tom O'Hearn's tries uh, came about. But they were just, you know, kicking game was really good. They were threatening Exeter in a lot of different ways. And if they can just, you know, if they had if they had seen out that game, I was doing the live blog for it on, on RT on Sunday afternoon. And as you're hitting the 60th minute, you're saying this is, this was by a mile the best Munster had played all season. Now, unfortunately... Games are eighty minutes, not sixty. Yeah, and that, look, I, I, I think you saw Graham Entry's frustration afterwards. Um, just it must have been just so weird for them seeing the team just kind of collapse and uh, collapse is a bit harsh because actually Connor gets that Connor. I think Connor's playing for a penalty there. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I would have fancied Munster to kick. I, lo- I looked back and and the when you look at the pass, 
it looked a good bit ahead of who was it outside? I, I can't remember what back it was outside. My, we'll say yeah. it's Crowley, for example, but it it looked it looked closer to that Exeter defensive line than it did towards towards his hands. Like it yeah. probably was playing for the penalty. It's playing for a penalty, and and like if he gets the penalty, it's unbelievably smart. That's the experience you're bringing off the bench to 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 guide you through that. And and I wouldn't have backed against Munster not going down and actually getting the score. To be honest, um, if but obviously the the way the way it uh, played out with Slade going. Go fifty meters, and obviously, um, taking away the the losing bonus from Munster was was cruel. But yeah, uh, there's enough there that, that they can still build on. You know what I mean? And also, this team, they kind of went through a really rough patch last year to start the season, and it didn't didn't bother them. It didn't affect them. They they just got themselves sorted out. Um, they will get the likes of Klein back and and um Peter Manny back and. Simon hopefully get back after Christmas and they will give them a boost. Um so yeah, I wouldn't write Munster off. They're like they are a dangerous side. Um, but to be just deeply frustrated with how they've started the, this block in, in Champions Cup. Yeah, and I think you can't really ignore as well uh the fact the the injury list is very big at the Huge, moment. Yeah. There were two players on the bench there, Brian Leeson and Ben O'Connor, excellent prospects, but at the same time, it's a Champions Cup game and they're two guys that are going to be playing under 20s for Ireland in the in the Six Nations in the spring so it the context has to be to be put into that the last point yeah. on on Munster I want to mention as well though is Tom Ahern because that's that just Tom Ahern playing in the back row just continues to continues to work they're using him so much out wide when they're in attack and I was saying on Sunday it's one of those things where you never actually thought about it as an option but it's only when you saw it happen in the flesh you realise how on earth did we not realise this twelve months ago? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, and and I don't know if he's been playing. Uh, I I don't know if he's been playing any any uh, any rugby up till now at, at six. But no, he the, hadn't. We, we hadn't. spoke. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we spoke to him after the the Munster and Glasgow game, and he mm. said it was just the week of that Leinster match. It was um, yeah. it was mentioned to him. He hadn't done much in the back row at all. Obviously, like he he played as a fullback. I think up until he was like under 17 or 18 so he obviously has that athletic yeah. ability and knows how to play out wide and stuff like that but the the back row thing it just came out he, of the blue he's an exciting prospect at six yeah he's an exciting prospect at six um like he's been very impressive uh obviously he gives you that line of option but he's just an athlete but also he's aggressive he's aggressive as well and he's he's getting under people's skin um and the level he's got to quite quickly um is yeah, it, it it would lead you to believe that there's actually way more there, you know. Mm-hmm. So and also the way Munster play, you know, with with flankers uh, uh hold him weight on the edge, he is suited to that. Like he's very very dynamic in those areas, and obviously for cross field kicks, he has the height advantage as well. So, um, yeah, it's he, it's gonna be one to watch. I mean, um, it's like Pete gets back. I think Pete will be back for the Six Nations, but. What Farrell is going to do there long term, um, and who steps up? I thought Baird was unbelievably good against La Rochelle, a bit quieter, um, against Sale. But uh, Thomas Ahern is, is you'd you'd be shocked if he wasn't in that big squad when it's picked. Yeah, and I thought it was really interesting actually the fact that despite the fact that Munster have a bit of a second row shortage injuries wise at the moment, it was Gavin Coombs who started in started in the in the row at the weekend, and they kept Ahern out at six. This is obviously something that. It's not just a trial. They fancy doing this long term potentially as well. Yeah, and and why not? Jesus, like he's you want him in the team at the moment, mm-hmm. don't you? And and when all the locks are back, he may not, you know, get into that um uh into that second row. But if he can get game time at six and be a weapon for them there, um, I'm sure, I'm sure they'll continue to try and to try and find his his top potential. Really, I'll bring in Leinster now. Um. 37-27 winners against Sale. Funny old game at the RDS on Saturday. But as I said, I'm talking to Kaelin Doris a little bit later on and he mentioned, we were talking about Jack Neenaber and he mentioned how he hasn't just come in and tried to tweak a couple of little things here and there. How pretty much on day one, Neenaber arrived in and had new ideas and wanted to make big changes in season, which is quite interesting. And I think, Bert, you can, you can probably see it at times in the way they're playing at the moment. Like Doris spoke, for example, about how line speed is the big thing he's he's really focusing in on with Leinster. 
And you can probably see they got caught out with it for that first sale try where yeah. Sale and Fairness them worked that lovely little kick into just chipped it into the backfield. And uh it was um Robert Dupree catching onto it and, and putting Connor Doherty in for the for the opening try. So they're probably ironing out a few creases at the moment, but all in all it's going quite well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think it's great to see them just kind of stuck into it now. I mean, yeah. and like um it hasn't affected them. They've 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 been they're unbeaten since that first game against Glasgow, which was you know during the war. And think that they will continue to be able to win most of their games while adapting and learning. Um and yeah, and also I I, I know it's probably going to affect their attacking game a little bit. And some people like they're not going to stop doing attack at training, whatever. But mm -hmm. you have to understand that. It's only natural to give Jack a little bit more time um to to get his ideas in place because he missed um preseason, he missed last season when Andrew Goodman had a chance to to build it. So I think there'll be a little bit of and and we saw it in the first half where they just weren't all on the same page from an attacking point of view. Because I think Leinster have been a team who've been very attack focused. You know, their mindset has, has been always more around what we do with the ball. Um and now I think you're gonna see like I was watching the warm up, you know, lots of players coming up to Nina Bar just clarifying exactly what he wants. So in their mind as well, they're going to be thinking, look at, you know, new coach, you got to impress him. So defense is going to be a big part of that. And then as I said, as you said, he's obviously tweaking a few things, um, and you're probably going to get exposed a little bit in the backfield with little chips like that until everybody is a hundred percent sure of how to manage that. Um, which is fine. Obviously, they they turned on the the power in in the in the third quarter and, and negated that um that try for for sale and, and got the game under control but um yeah I, I think I want to see that I want to see them being exposed as well to a certain extent so they can fix it um uh and I think Nino Barrow understands that and Leo understands it and they'll just they'll just crack on with it on the the attack side of things um obviously it wasn't a perfect game first half was a bit sloppy in places but I thought what was just so impressive was at the start of that second half, it was just like it was just vintage Leinster where Leinster are kicking off, Ryan Baird runs up, gets a gets ahead of the ball, manages to flick it back on his side, and two minutes and fifty four seconds of unbroken possession, I think it's around twenty two, twenty three phases. Sale did not touch the ball for those opening three minutes of the half, and it finishes with uh, eventually. Like Sale defended it quite well, to be totally honest. There was a, a good bit of back and forth across the pitch from Leinster, but eventually they just got worn down. There's a slip. Van der Fleer breaks through, puts Gibson Park in for a try, and and from there they never really looked back. Yeah, in fairness, and that's what they do. And uh, when they do that, not many people can teams can live with them. Um, and I thought, yeah, I, I thought they came out of the, they obviously got that try just before half time for Van der yeah. Fleer. But just settle them, and then obviously they came out and just for twenty minutes. There was only one team in it, and put the, put the game to to bed, and did it kind of with just real force, um, and playing really pragmatic, direct, pragmatic, direct rugby. And Sale, who had looked just handle that, just just couldn't stop them on the game line. Some of those big carriers were uh, were very effective, and even Asai off the bench was giving them a little bit of punch, and yeah, it was. It was clinical, to be fair, and then obviously they had a little bit of a blip at the end again when, um, that, well, at first they were down thirteen men for the last try, but they got exposed a couple of times, um, late in the game when the game was put to bed. So still plenty to work on, but um, I thought, thought McCarthy was impressive again when he, the minutes he got, um, you know, Doris Porter Sheen was excellent. So, um, yeah, well, look, 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 Leinster, Leinster aren't playing brilliantly, but. They're ticking along nicely as well, and I think there, there's elements of their game getting exposed that they they'll fix, which was which is even, which is more important for them than free freestyling and freewheeling into fifty point wins. Last point on Leinster and Munster, obviously playing on St Stephen's Day. Um, just your general thoughts on it, because I I find it is hard to actually talk about it at this point in the week where we really don't know what sort of a team Leinster are going to be sending down. You imagine there's going to be some bit of a rotation with internationals over Christmas given the load players had in the World Cup as well. So difficult to really talk about the actual match itself at this point in the week. Yeah, unfortunately, I'd love to have the two teams now, wouldn't you? And just yeah. um, just get excited about it. 
the rumor is Leinster are going to go reasonably strong, but I mean, what does that mean? You know, um, in terms reasonably of, strong, yeah, reasonably strong for Leinster is probably still leaving still very str- yeah. seven or eight he's players. Yeah, so. yeah, is it the same team that he said to Connacht, which <laughs> you know was a it was a second string, but yeah, it was still good. You know, um, so that's the, that's a challenge. I'd love to see like a full full strength uh, Leinster play a full strength monster in Tolman and give the give the fans you know value for money. Um, and I still hope it will be at least a 60 70 percent, um, str- full strength Leinster team, um, 60 uh, percent of the of the of the best team. So, so, yeah, let's wait and see. But a big one for Munster now, um, like they they came to Viva and put it up to Leinster, but on the back of what's happened in the last two weeks, um, they probably need a a, a win more more so than um, than Leinster do, yeah. I, more so just for the spectacle itself yeah. and the occasion I'm really looking forward to being down there in the 26th like I'm from Limerick I always I, I always enjoy working that match around Christmas but I do have to say like last year's game between the two of them it felt like it felt like the best atmosphere and the best buzz around a Munster Leinster fixture that I could remember for a good few years around Limerick uh, I remember getting down to Thoman Park about two and a half hours before the match and there were tons of people already around the place having a few pints having a burger or whatever. And it just felt very, very different to even a big Champions Cup game. And I just hope that with that rivalry, we can kind of keep it at that level or even grow it a bit further again. Um, On to Ulster, 31-15 against Racing 92. Burst their best performance of the season and best result of the season, bang on when they needed it. Yeah, brilliant, to be fair. I think... um, Ulster fans, Ulster, Ulster management would be so happy because... They needed to, to to show a little bit, and they did. They got it in spades, and uh, uh, hopefully that's the kind of the turning the, the turning point for them for the for the season. And and look, they haven't. They probably feel that the criticism has been a little bit over the top, but um, because the results haven't been brutal, but um, they just hadn't had a performance where you went right. They're in a really good place. Um, they're going to do something this season, and I thought there was lots of elements of that. You know Stockdale, Hume. Um, you know I thought Kitchoff was really, really good. His best performance for him so far. Um, they just hassled Harry Rassing. Um, and yeah, uh, took advantage of of opportunities they got in the twenty two. We're we're pretty clinical, and it was a really, really good performance. Now Rassing, you know Rassing had lost the week before to Bath, or not to Bath to Harlequins, and Harlequins got smashed by Toulouse. So. Maybe they're not the the force this year in in Europe that they have been over the last couple of years, but um, it's still a very very good win for Ulster and something I think they'll take a lot of confidence out of. And, and obviously now they've got Connacht um on uh, over or Connacht uh, at the weekend, um, which should be winnable and 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 they can come down to Dublin on uh, New Year's Day in a really good place. I think. Yeah, and important for them to back it up against Connacht as well. Just quickly staying on Ulster, what I really, really enjoyed was just a bit of innovation around like the five metre penalties, but they were changing things up. I know Dan McFarland spoke after the game about how they were having these little laboratories out on the pitch where they were like the mad scientists, try, you know, trial and error on a few different variations of, of the five metre moves. They had that one where basically they just set up them all in field and shoved their way over. They had that one where John Cooney just popped it up into Nick Timoney's hands rather than having someone bending down to tap the ball with their foot. Mm. And um, it was just... One thing I've loved in rugby in the last four or five years is just how this five-metre tap and go has just come back into the the rugby lexicon almost. Where... Yeah. Go back to... I can't remember exactly what year, but say 2016-17. You could go an entire season and not see one team try a five-metre tap and go move. Mm. And I just love how it reached a point where everyone started doing it and now you have everyone trying to figure out little variations and little innovations on it. And it's just so much fun. Yeah, it is. It's great. And um, it was it was really interesting to hear McFarland talk about how they spent Henderson. Henderson came up with it first, but um, there's some nice variations of it. Uh, uh, and all the Irish provinces are, are doing it. The, the, the first one that I remember... In, it was the Bulls doing it against Leinster in the in the RDS, and they the actually went to yeah. beat them in the semi final. And then since then, I think nearly every team has 
a trick play in their in their repertoire and, and um it's great to see them evolving and um they are a weapon now look at uh, the, the risk is obviously if you get held up um it's a it's a goal line dropout so teams are very careful when they really go for that um that final push and show and, and but if you can get momentum on your first or second carry with with a little bit of trickery um it could do the job for you so no it was good and i think it obviously gave Ulster confidence as well that they had something new to bring to the party and then obviously when it works uh, it's uh, it's even better um finally then just quickly on Connacht um we'll talk about them a bit more next week after they after they play Ulster and ahead of their game against Munster but 55 35 away to Sar- away to Saracens on Saturday it's two heavy defeats in a row um the game against Saracens though it felt very different to the game against Bordeaux where against Bordeaux the heads dropped and mm. they looked to beat and dock it from well early out even against Saracens when the result of the game was probably out of question there was a bit of promise and it was encouraging to see them just keep going and just get something to take out of the game, like that four try bonus point where, you know, obviously the game had been well beaten. Saracens clearly were a much better team, but I think, I don't know, maybe am, am I being a little bit too simplistic? But it, was it important for them just to, to get something from that game to something tangible to take away and bring back into a, no, it was, it was massive. Period? No, no, it was, it was so important for them. And I agree with you. I thought, like from a tactic point of view, obviously they they hurt Saracens um a few times and that'll certainly give them um a bit of hope and belief. The problem for me is just shipping fifty. Yeah. Um that can be you know, it depends on how they frame that in their own minds and obviously like you would have thought, okay, we're going to Saracens, you know, we also need to show a little bit more steel defensively. Um because that was obviously a very we- a weakness against Bordeaux when they shipped forty odd. Uh, it's second time this season as well. Yeah. They've fifty with the Bulls as well. Yeah, you know what I mean. That's just not a good place. To, it's not a good habit to get into. Um, and I think Fardy obviously will be. That's his side of the uh of the of the business. So he he'll be a little bit worried about that. Um, yeah, I, I think they got enough out of it to basically be able to get some hope and confidence for for this week. But it wasn't. Um, they're still under. how they pitch up in, in England. Yeah, and it does set things up nicely between those two results at the weekend for a derby that means a lot this weekend where both teams, okay, Ulster got back on track with that win against Racing, but in terms of URC, both sides are on a little bit of a of a bad run at the moment. And whoever loses this weekend is, is going to be feeling in a tough spot because either Connacht lose and they're bringing Munster to the sports ground next week or Ulster lose and they're bringing or they're heading to the RDS to take on Leinster. Not a place you want to be. No, absolutely not. No, this is a this is a massive game. Um, but on form, you can like well, based on last week's form, Ulster should have you know serious confidence that they'll 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 get a win. And I think it's really important for Ulster to back it up. You know, back it up uh, that win because I said they haven't been consistent. Um, and I think the Ravenhill faithful will will be behind them. Um, you know they they'll be gutted how they lost the return fixture in the sports ground. Have been in a, uh, you know, very dominant position. So uh, I can't see Ulster, Ulster slipping up here. And I think Connacht the ones are going to be under a little bit of pressure to to stay in the top eight by and having to beat Munster um or in, in the in the second fixture over Christmas. Right. Well, we look forward to see it happen. That is Ulster hosting Connacht on Friday night, 7.35 kickoff at Kingspan Stadium. Live commentary on RT Radio 1 Extra on Friday night. And then Munster hosting Leinster is on St. Stephen's Day. Live coverage on RT 2 and RT Player from 7 o'clock and coverage on the radio as well on RT Radio 1. Birch, have a great Christmas if I don't see you between now and next week. Well, and uh, I'm day. sure I'll catch you at Tumman Park. You will. It's take you. Oh. Bye-bye. Coming up next, Caelan Doris, folks. Speaking to us now is Ireland and Leinster backer Caelan Doris. He's been unveiled as an ambassador for JFW Renewables, one of Ireland's leading solar energy companies specialising in the installation of solar PV panels in homes, businesses and farms across the country. You can get in touch for a free, no obligation consultation. Just visit JFWRenewables.com. 
rugby.ie. Caelan, thanks a million for joining us on the RT Rugby podcast. And and first up, congratulations on the new contract. Uh, the news arrived earlier this week, a three-year deal up to, to 2027. A nice one for yourself to get. I imagine, though, friends and family probably even happier. It's going to mean there's a bit of expectation on you to deliver some pretty big Christmas presents now. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having me, first of all. And uh, yeah, no, it's a good time and nice little early Christmas present for me. But as you say, the expectations have definitely gone up. So um, yeah, we'll see what we can do there. I'm delighted to stay on for another three years plus. Um, two special environments that I've, I love being a part of over the last few years. And um, yeah, we've got great quality in players and in uh, in staff and coaches leading us in the right way so um yeah looking forward to being here for another while thankfully yeah great stuff and um obviously it's a deal that's done and dusted nice and nice and early in the season that would lead me to thinking it was a fairly straightforward process there weren't any hiccups along the way it was a deal you were you were happy to get over the line i imagine yeah yeah definitely we've been kind of it had been in the works for a little while but um yeah, good to have it over the line heading into the new year, as you say. And uh, yeah, no, it's been it's been great playing for Ireland and playing for Leinster over the last while. And um, it was a pretty straightforward decision, really. Um, like I mentioned there, there's so much quality and two very satisfying environments to be a part of. And I think someone at my stage of their career, it's uh, it's a perfect place to be and it's a good place to grow and continue to improve as a player and pick up knowledge and experience and wisdom from everyone around me. So um, now I'm excited to continue it. And like the fact as well, it's a central contract with the IRFU. It's it must be um it must put a lot of things in perspective for yourself and give yourself a nice little reality check of and confidence of of where you are in your career because you just look at the sheer competition of of back row back row players across the country. So to be to be high up on that list, it must be nice and reaffirming for yourself. Yeah, no, it is class. I think Ireland have always produced, they've done a very good job producing back rows, whatever it is about our genetics. Um, we seem to be good over the ball and, and good in this position and have been for the last while. So, yeah, as you said, there's so much competition. Uh, even within Leinster, you've got guys like James Gallan coming through who's Played some very good games um, for Leinster this season and we've seen what he can do with Ireland 20s in the past as well. So it's funny coming back from the World Cup and then seeing someone like him um, who's been playing very well week in, week out and kind of keeps you on your toes and um, drives the message that you really need to keep improving and keep performing week to week. Or There's plenty of other guys there who are willing and capable to, to take the position. So, um, no, yeah, like I said, it's, it's all exciting and... I uh I feel there's still plenty more growth in me as a player, so um I'm I'm looking forward to trying to eke out that potential. Yeah, and then I I suppose on the flip side, like just seeing the list of of players who are their back row alternatives, obviously keeps you keeps you on your toes and cuts out any complacency. But on your own own place in the Irish team, I was looking back at it earlier on, and you're on this remarkable run in the Irish team of. Since you missed out on that 2021 Six Nations, Ireland have played 29 games in that time. You've played in all 29 of those. 28 of those have been starts and just one appearance off the bench. There's kind of two sides of it to to look at. I'll come on to the the competition and the, you know, the, the back row competition in a couple of moments. But first of all, just the durability to do it. Like, is there stuff you're doing week on week? I know obviously you have to have a bit of a look where you're avoiding a proper injury that's going to rule you out for weeks or months at a time. But are there other little bits that you're doing along the way week on week that are just keeping yourself ticking over, making sure that minor minor little knocks aren't going to be affecting you the following week? Is that something you've kind of learned to develop over your, I suppose, six, seven years now in in professional rugby? Yeah, well, like you say, there's definitely been a bit of good fortune. There's certain injuries that are pretty hard to avoid. And um, no matter what you're doing week to week, it sometimes you just do get unfortunate. But there's yeah, there's definitely things that you can do and that I have implemented and have taken from some of the older, more experienced guys who look after their bodies very well. Um, guys like Johnny or Keen Healy and Jamie Heaslip in the past who all would have invested a lot of time and money into 
um, maintaining their bodies and getting the most out of themselves. So, yeah, we're looked after very well in terms of how many games we play a season too. So that helps. But little things like massage, physio, uh, stretching, yoga, all the sort of usual stuff. And then even from a psychological point of view, the whole mind-body connection is something that fascinates me. And um, I'm not sure how much of an impact that has had, but sort of staying on top of uh, my mental well-being and mental health as well might have some implications in terms of the durability too potentially is there stuff you do around that the the mental side of the game week on week to to just keep yourself fresh yeah well you've got the sort of more um cliche things like visualization or the sort of more sports psychology elements like goal setting visualization self-talk um mindfulness things like that but then yeah, I, i've done therapy as well for the last number of years but my parents are psychotherapists so it was a bit of a natural um progression or natural interest of mine or something i wanted to explore um so that's a weekly thing that i do as well separate from the rugby um which probably does carry over a little bit because if you're happy you're gonna you're gonna play better and if you've less things or less concerns um less things on your chest there's a little bit of yeah lightness going into the game so um yeah I, I think that has helped me as well how helpful has it been particularly after i suppose coming back off of disappointments rather than the the great days like a grand six nations grand slam but where you're in a situation where you lose a champions cup final and then you're heading into a world cup camp and obviously the world cup ends in in the disappointing way that it did and and then you're into another season like in terms of being able to to make sure there isn't a hangover from from one tournament into the other and just being able to to pick up where you left off? Um, yeah, it's definitely been useful in that regard. I think regardless of whether it's highs or lows, it's kind of always trying to stay in a place of equanimity to some degree and um, stay grounded and, um, yeah, keep, keep sort of present and... Um, stay working hard and whatnot so um no it's been good i've got good people around me and um i've sort of had some pretty open and honest conversations with those people around me which helps as well it's always vital to have a good support network and um people who have my best interest at heart and who i can fully entrust in so i've got that too which i'm very fortunate to have yeah it must be a real a real help on the competition side of things then has the the, the position of back row or or of number eight even specifically changed much over the years where we're seeing a lot more players, I suppose, positionally, there seems to be a lot more fluidity across the back row of, you know, you you go back and forth between between six and eight. You've played a couple of games at seven as well over, over the last year or so. And even as a trend globally in rugby, we seem to be seeing a lot more second rows dropping in and, and playing at six monster doing it these days with, with Tom O'Hearn. Is there... Is the the position and the the role of that player changing a little bit over the years? Um, well, I think it's probably more so a case of the overall standard of skill set skill set across forwards has improved pretty dramatically over the last ten or fifteen years, I'd say. Um, so you've got second rows in the past who are literally just there to scrum, line out, hit rooks, whereas now you're seeing second rows who are good footballers and capable of. 20 yard passes or giving out out the back door passes or offloading or whatever it is. So I think the overall standard of skill sets definitely increased. And um, there's probably with that comes, particularly in the back row, comes an expectation of having a varied skill set and being able to do attack on both sides of the ball in terms of being, yeah, pretty competent in defense, in getting turnovers, in making your tackles, but also in attack and carrying and being a little bit of a ball player as well. So um yeah i think having competition drives that and the way we train in leinster and in ireland drives that as well um and everyone is sort of has a plan around their work ons and where they want to improve and their strengths and maintaining those and improving those too so um yeah no i, I think i'm not sure if the positions change too much but i think the overall skill set amongst the forwards has improved has there been an area of your own game over the last year or 18 months maybe that you've honed in on a little bit more that you wanted to to upskill in? Um, not so much over the last 18 months, but a more recent focus is sort of, I've given my defence quite a bit of time and energy over the last while and um, 
I've been pretty happy with that with how that's going, bar conceding a few too many penalties for my liking. But um I yeah, I want to start getting my hands on the ball a bit more and offering myself around the park a little bit more. And traditionally for me, going back even to school and underage, my carrying was probably my best trait or best characteristic. So um I yeah, I want to keep offering and keep getting my carry stats and times I get my hands on the ball up. Um it's something I've kind of been conscious of has faded away a small bit over the last while. So yeah, I want to keep that area ground and get it back to where I think it can be. Is that a is that a challenge where you you put a little bit of emphasis on one area of your game to develop and, and potentially then forget about the things that that made you what you were to begin with? Is there a little bit of a balancing act to be done there? Yeah, yeah, can juggle. Sometimes if you put too much energy into something, it gets taken away from somewhere else. So um yeah, trying to give them all equal time and energy um, and, and get to a place where I'm competent and, and good across the board because I think the best players do have a pretty varied skill set across them all. So that's something I'm striving towards. I saw you speaking recently as well since the World Cup about trying to maybe be a bit more vocal where we've obviously, Leinster and Ireland, now Johnny Sexton has moved on and we all know how big of a leader he was and you're someone who's captain teams coming through the coming through the age grades is that I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you about you know captaining Ireland or something is but is stepping up as a leader or as a talker either in camp or out on the pitch is that something that you're kind of looking towards yeah I think so it's it's sort of something my first few years in Leinster after captaining Ireland I was sort of looking around me at all these lads who I've been watching since I was a young fella and feeling that there was so much experience and so much knowledge across them and sort of the feeling that, oh, they know much more than me. I, how could I offer any anything here when they've done this and done that and know so much more? But I'm sort of getting to the stage now where I'm I'm 25. I've got 36 caps for Ireland. I've been around the block a little bit and feel I've a fair bit of knowledge and experience myself to share. So, um, yeah, I'm sort of pushing myself to try and lead a little bit more and speak up a little bit more in meetings if I do have something to say that could be beneficial to someone else, whether it be someone younger or older. So, um, yeah, trying to trying to push that. I do enjoy it. It's sort of stretching the comfort zone a little bit for me, but I do I do enjoy it when I do it as well. So, yeah, it's definitely something I'm putting a little bit more focus on too. It's probably something we don't really um consider too much when we talk about younger players coming through because pretty much every... 18, 19, 20 year old coming through the academy system has by and large been one of, if not the best players on their teams going through at club level or schools level coming through. And all of a sudden you're in a situation where you're out on a pitch and there's 40 plus of you out there. And there could be, in Leinster's case, there could be 20 to 25 internationals out there. And all of a sudden you you might feel a little bit small out there when you're an academy kid coming through and there's all these internationals around. Yeah, definitely. I, I remember even just my first year in the academy having lunch beside like Jamie Heaslip and Keane Healy and these guys who I'd watched literally since I was in primary school. Um, so it was well, it's kind of surreal and you're kind of pinching yourself a little bit at the fact of sharing your meals with them and eventually training with them and playing with them. But you kind of yeah, you do you do adjust quite quickly and realize that they're just normal, down to earth, hard working people too. So um, yeah, no, you adjust fairly quickly. And when you came back then after the World Cup, obviously you were gone for a long time. There was a big pre-season. Did you notice there were some of those younger players who felt and looked a bit more comfortable in their own skin in the environment where they had three or four months where a lot of the more high-profile players were away and that probably gives them an opportunity to to learn their voice a little bit in the system? Yeah, I think so. I think Leo and the coaches would push the younger guys to speak up and to not feel like they're not fully a part of the environment or that there's more important people or more knowledgeable people and kind of to spread the load across everyone and realize that we're all equal. Um, So that that's coming from the top down a bit, but at the same time, it is helpful when some of the bigger name guys are away and um, it is more of a shared load across everyone. So you become a little bit more comfortable even in the building and with some of those, Lancer players too so um, no it's helpful What are the early impressions so far of, of Jacques Nienaber? He's been great he's been great very energetic enthusiastic guy 
um, very passionate about defense and passionate about collisions and uh, being physically dominant. And yeah, you've seen that with the teams he's coached in the past, obviously South Africa most recently and the success he's had there. Um, it's kind of been interesting to get an insight into the D system that he that he coaches and sometimes looking at some of those teams, you, you think it looks a little bit erratic, but there is method behind the madness and um, yeah, no, it's something that we're all excited about and it's a nice change for us and it's even good having someone focusing purely on defence and someone focusing on attack in Andrew Goodman, so it's nice having that split too, which is something that's new for us in Leinster. Obviously, Sri Lankaster did an unbelievable job doing both and managed them both very well, but it's nice having a few voices now this year. And like, he's obviously only been there a few weeks. Has he come in and just tried to make small adjustments so far with the with the aim of, you know, by the start of next season, having made large changes or did he come in on day one and say, guys, OK, from today, we're going to be doing X, Y and Z? More so the latter. Yeah, he's kind of thrown us, thrown us in the deep end a little bit and wants us to make a load of mistakes and wants us to find our own feet in this new system and build those new habits because we've been sort of it's it's basically a much more aggressive defensive system and bringing a lot more line speed, which takes a bit of getting used to. And sometimes in games, you kind of fall back to the habits you built over the last while and what you're used to. So he's really pushing us to to get familiar with the new system and bring a little bit more line speed and stuff like that. So, yeah, no, it's exciting. Uh, it's been it's been fun having him coaching us and he gets quite involved on the pitch. Um, he's a pretty, pretty passionate man. Yeah, the early signs are good. And we had a few decent wins so far since he arrived, particularly, obviously, the La Rochelle one. Um, with that game, no trophies handed out at the end of the day, obviously. But was that a significant win for you just as a team, just to prove yourselves you could do it, having come so close on a couple of occasions to, to one specific team? I think so, yeah. I think we've had some pretty intense battles excuse me, uh, with them over the last number of years. And... I've come out in the wrong side a few too many times. So there is quite a rivalry that's been built there. And this game being our first European one, being over in France, it, it was sort of earmarked from quite a while out. And there was excitement um, in the week building up to it massively. And there's a bit of emotion given the last two years finals and whatnot as well. So um, there was great excitement going into the week and traveling over there and um, good belief as well that we could do it. And, um, hopefully it'll sort of be a little bit of a springboard to our European season. Um, as you say, it's early stages and still a hell of a lot of work to be done. and A lot of improve, improving needed too, but given the circumstances and the conditions over there and the manner of the game being such a physically abrasive one and almost being better off without the ball at stages, um, yeah, to come away with that win was pleasing. And Kieran Frawley's kick at the end was a nice moment as well. Yeah, and you've had two pretty tough games now in the Champions Cup and coming through with two wins. Did you ever feel with hindsight looking back on the last couple of seasons where Leinster pretty much would have blitzed their way through the, the pool stages? Was there ever an impression now that you look back on it that maybe things came a little bit too easy for you during the pool stages? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. I think it's, regardless of the opposition we're playing, we sort of focus on ourselves a fair bit and have our own standards to hit and our own potential that we want to reach. Um, obviously, facing better teams and getting challenged in different ways is conducive to being successful and test you in different ways. So that is important too. So there's possibly an element of that, but at the same time, I think we face high quality teams throughout our season, both URC internationally as well. So we were tested a number of times and even playing to lose the week before in the semi was quite a test too so and Leicester the week before that so we were we were facing some pretty some pretty good teams yeah and speaking of big games in the URC a couple coming up in the next few weeks as well we've got Munster and St Stephen's Day and and Ulster then back at the RDS on on New Year's Day have you any idea yet what your schedule is looking like we obviously don't know what way the internationals go has there been a decision made on are people going to be rested for a couple of games here or there or do you expect to be at, at Thoman Park next week I haven't heard yet. We've been off the last couple of days uh, since the sale game. So we're in tomorrow. So yeah, hopefully I'll, I'll get word in the next few days. But um, I haven't played there in the last number of years. Going back to, I think I played 2019 and 2020 possibly. And it's, yeah, it's always 
a pretty good atmosphere and a special game to be involved in. Um, lots of passionate Munster fans and a few Leinster travelling down as well. So, um, no, it's it's a good place to play. And it's a little bit of a pity to take a little bit away from your Christmas day, but I think it's worth it, especially if you get the win down there on Stephen's Day. So, um, I'll be excited if I'm playing and if I'm not, I'll enjoy my Christmas a little bit more, but I'll be happy either way. Yeah, finally then, what what are the Christmas plans or is it is it dictated by whether or not you're playing on St. Stephen's Day? Yeah, I'll be going back to Mayo um, for Christmas Day anyway, but the length of time at home will be dictated by whether I'm playing or not. So yeah, hopefully we'll get news in the next couple of days and I'll have a bit more of a plan, but I'll be touching base. My brother's back from LA on Thursday for six or seven days. So it'd be nice to have the full family back together for the first time in a couple of years back home. Great stuff. Well, look, as Josh van der Fleer said to us at the weekend, regardless of whether or not you're playing on St. Stephen's Day, you can stuff your face anyway, because you're either going to be carb loading or you don't have to worry about it. But um, <laughs> either way, enjoy it, Caelan. It's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, have a great Christmas. Cheers. Likewise. Happy Christmas to you. All the best.